The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. I want to make some announcements while we're receiving the tithes and offering. Uh, keep us in prayer, and also this is for some of the volunteers and some of my leaders. Um, oh, I have it right in my notes. Receive the offering. <laughs> <laughs> Who put that in there? Jennifer, did you put that in my notes? Okay. Hey, I'm new at this. I've only been doing this for 40 years. I can't remember everything. All right. First of all, Wednesday, August 31st, and Thursday, September 1st, uh, from roughly 9 to 12.30, and then perhaps afterwards, uh, we're going to be teaching uh, during the orientation week for uh, Morningstar University's first-year students. So if you're a first-year student in here, anybody? You're, you're going to get us whether you want it or not. Uh, and September 8th, uh, we're going to be doing training uh, with the Morning Star volunteers who will be assisting us in the Children's Harvest Fest. We're, we're being stretched, aren't we, Jennifer? We did the 50 plus, then we're going to do the MSU students, and then we're going to do the little children for Harvest Fest, three days. We're going to be training uh, the volunteers at Morning Star, but also uh, I want some of my volunteers to come in as well. And so September 8th, 7 o'clock at night, we'll be training. Um, at Morning Star. I'll give you more details later. Uh, September 10th to the 13th, River of Life Christian Fellowship in Connecticut. Those that are watching by Ustream, uh, if you're in that Connecticut area, the Hartford, Connecticut, Tolland area, we will be there for the Sunday morning and Sunday evening service, September 10th. September 22nd, 23rd, and 24th will be the Children's Conference or the Harvest Fest Children's Conference here. Now, what I wanted to have accomplished here this morning is what the Lord laid on my heart. He says, he says, I want you to break the normal order. I want you to go to inspiration before the education. I have a tendency to preach and teach the system and then do altar ministry at the end, but I think you need to see that this is not a teaching concept. This has changed lives. And so, uh, the sermon for today is transference of spirits. That ought to get your interest anyway. Transference of spirit. How many know there's good and bad transfers? All right. Well, we're going to teach you uh, how to do it good and how to do it right. But before that, I wanted to see the practical inspiration. And we are fortunate to have with us today uh, a couple of sisters that we met in Israel uh, ministered at the table in the, vest, uh, in the foyer area in the hotel. And uh, the next thing I know, I had a whole table full of people that got ministry. And she took this material. She's also a student. Nelson, you're online, right? You're on the team, the team online embassy. And she's taking all the modules, but she's ministering to hundreds of Hispanic people. Our material in Spanish, like the quick guides and the books and everything, and uh, I'm going to ask her to come and share quickly. She's like me there. She's a preacher. I don't know if you can do quickly. Can you do quickly? Tell us, tell us what you've learned and what you're doing. And we are now mom and dad. Mom and papa. So you're my brother, Jason, okay? My granddaughter keeps <laughs> thinking that I'm calling mom. her up here. Oh my gosh. Um, one of the neat things that um, I've learned from this ministry is to really be set free from the things that have kept me in bondage that I didn't even know were deep inside of me. I just knew I was behaving a certain way. I was limited in a certain way, but I didn't really know what was doing all that. I mean, I was binding, casting the devil, fasting, meditating, you name it. I was doing it, you know, rustling, you know, travailing, and all that has its place. But I still felt that I was under this, 
like hand, like heavy hand, you know? And as I started the ministry here, just online, doing the modular one, doing all the different works, and especially the 60-day challenge, that blew me away. We started, my sister and I, I think it was December 6th, and we're on, I'm on day 46, she's on day 49, eight months. And because it was just so much in me. And so as the Lord started showing me all the things that were inside of me, I thought, my gosh, this is real. This is really happening. I, I have forgotten all this stuff, you know. And it's coming up, but not to condemn me, but to set me free. And the Lord just started setting me free. And, I mean, here I am in my, in my little, because I converted my closet into a, not a prayer room where I sleep. And the Lord just started really ministering. And I'm just crying out. And the Lord just said, now it's time to share because it's real to you. And I started sharing. I own a tax business and a real estate business. We do a lot of finances. So we have a lot of people that are there doing their taxes. They sit in front of me, a lot of Hispanic people, a lot of people that have a lot of religion. And so we started sharing in the office, sharing, giving out. I got a bunch of the modulars in Spanish. I just got everything I can get in Spanish. And I started giving it to people. You know how God is so faithful. He will bring those that are ready. And, I mean, I have pastors from different churches that I do taxes for. And God just started moving so mightily. We just started just breaking down all these walls and all these barriers in my office when I got like a bunch of people sitting down like that waiting to come in. And here we are, you know, just laying hands, people dropping down. I had attorneys because my office is next to an attorney's office. But let me tell you, this attorney came in front of me and that was it. He dropped down and God just started to just break down that whole knowledgeable, you know, concept and got it all together. And he just, just totally started to weep. And I gave him the deep um, relief now and that was it transformed his entire life. So we just started seeing this over and over. Little children, my niece and nephew that are like six at that time and four, dropping down when they misbehave, just bringing the peace of God. Well, I started to bring that towards more of the people that I knew more and more. Wherever I go, I show a house. That's it. I lay hands on the person that's there. I, I, you know, I give them any kind of material that, that I have. I have it in my car. I got all kinds of material because I want to be ready. I want to be ready. I don't just want to tell them. I just want to I want them to have the material so they can go out and give it to somebody else. And I've just been doing this wherever I go. And so the Lord touched my heart of this ministry that we have at church called Ray Has Ministry, which is human trafficking. Listen to this. It's human trafficking. And guys, this is here. This is in our backyard. You know, it's not in a third world country. It's in our backyard. I mean, literally in our backyard. And I said, Lord, I don't know. Am I ready? So, of course, I called mom and papa like hell because, you know, I don't want this in my own strength or my own experience. I want this to be led by God. And I just started ministering. The Lord has put me in like a short period of time to be like the first contact because I thought, well, how am I going to just go in there and, you know, minister to these girls. So I'm first contact with me, which means that whenever they, the FBI, you know, or, or, or the police department finds a girl, they call the church and or the ministry, and then I'm the one going. I'm like, oh, my goodness, how do I do Let's this, Let's thank Lord? the Lord for that. That's <laughs> but a divine you know appointment. God is good because mm. I would have been never been able to do this. And then he put me in a position where we've given uh, the books from the ministry here to the founder to my pastor's wife, and to all these people in leadership as the Lord would lead. Because you know what? This is a message that people need all over, wherever you're at. It doesn't matter whether they're Muslim, the Hindu, doesn't matter. They need this. Jesus Christ is real, and he's really doing a work from the depth of is our Is this beings. transference of spirits experiential instead of theoretical? She's taken what we've given her and poured into her, made it her own, and now is committing and entrusting and imparting into the lives of, of many. You know, I've always been radical. I mean, I got born again 32 years ago, and God delivered me from more junk than you can imagine. And uh, I was always radical. But you know when you go radical and you minister to someone and, you, and you're like, damn, you don't have enough time because you don't see the impact. But when you drop them down, oh, my gosh, you see the impact. Like right away, they're like angry, want to kill somebody. Come in, I'm going to get divorced. That guy, I hate him. I had a couple real quick. <laughs> they hated each other. I mean, you just felt like they were going to kill each other. And I know them for years. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, Jesus, I'm just stepping back. And the Lord says, no, you're not. I'm like, okay. So I started ministering to them. And the whole, well, really, I take that back. I didn't minister to him. The Holy Spirit did. Because I didn't do nothing but just tell him, okay, close your eyes, drop down. And the Holy Spirit wiped them. I mean, wiped. They're crying. He's crying. And instead of hating each other, 
They walked out with her holding each other's hands. This is real, guys. It will transform anybody. And don't look at their face, because you know what? It's nothing to do with their face. They can look as angry as anything. They're little boys and girls right. inside, needing, crying out, help me, man. Do you love me enough Amen. to do it? Amen. Amen. Okay, Janice. Now, Janice moved in the gifts of the Spirit long before she met us, but she says, I'm going to learn how to incorporate what you're teaching and what I do. And she did. We want the stories. This is, she does this so regularly. We only want the current Vegas trip, which was, what, a week ago? Yeah. Just, here, this is just last week. Yeah, so I went to Lake, uh, Vegas for a business trip this past week, and uh, it was kind of supernatural how that happened. Uh, my dad had a dream about this girl in my business that I never met. I met her like a month ago, and then she's like, you've got to come to Vegas and pour into my team, because I started walking her through things, and she was getting free. And so this girl in this company, she's t number one, one of the number one people in the company, she just like said, you're coming in, you're going to stay with me. So I flew out to Vegas as I was flying out. My flight got delayed, so I was like, okay, Jesus, there must be a reason why my flight got delayed. So then as soon as uh, my second flight, I actually made, praise God, this girl actually, she came in beside me, and she was from England. I said, what are you going to Vegas for, just with her family? I was like, oh, that's amazing. I was just like, and I just, I gave her like a word. And then all of a sudden, I was like, do you know why, what your destiny is? Do you even know what your purpose is? And she kind of looked at me, she goes, no. I was like, well, what do you do for a living? She goes, oh, I'm a Reiki healer. I go, oh, I'm a Jesus healer. <laughs> Have you heard of that? <laughs> and she was just like, uh, no, what is that? And she goes, I go, my mom's one of these big Reiki healers in England. I was like, oh, that's amazing. And her mom's like right in front of me. So she's kind of like turning around and listening like this. <laughs> like, what's she doing to my daughter? <laughs> and uh, I just like, uh, so I just started showing her. At first, she just couldn't get it. I was like, let's just focus on Jesus. And I was like, oh, wait, I remember what Jen said. They have to receive it first. So, <laughs> so this girl did not know the Lord. So, she, but she was so open. All those new age people are open. And, um, so I was like, all right, let's just, you know, picture a bucket in your head. She's like, okay, I'm picturing a bucket in my head. And then, like, I go, just drop it down to your spirit where your belly is. She's like, okay. She's like, oh, I feel it, yes. And then, <laughs> <laughs> and then I was like, all right, now let's just open your heart to receive Jesus. <laughs> so she started opening up her heart to receive Jesus in her heart. She's like, oh. And she goes, I feel it, yes. And all of a sudden, all that confusion broke, and she was able to hear the Lord. And she received Jesus right then and there. And uh, all of a sudden, she get, I go, all right, now Jesus, I said, Jesus made you a million years ago. And I was like, he had a plan for your life. So ask him what would bring him the most joy for, that would bring him the most joy for you to do with your life. She goes, okay. And she goes, oh, my God, I see, like, Jesus. I see this world. She's like, it's, like, spinning around. And she's, like, going like this in the airplane, and her mom's, like, turning around, and people are just, like, looking. She's like, wow. She's like, yeah. Like, he keeps on, like, stopping on Africa. She's like, oh, my God. And I was just like, yeah. And she goes, oh, my God, my hand's on fire. Like, what's this? And she goes, and then, and then I go, I ask him, what is it? She goes, I see a cell phone. He told me to Google I was like, well, he'll show you in the spirit what to Google. She's like, oh, my God. And she saw, like, this place. I don't remember what it was called. She goes, I see this place. So then she actually Googled it, and it was a real orphanage in Africa. And, like, she's like, oh, my God, I'm going to go there. Will you help? <laughs> and so, like, she's like, wow, this is amazing. I go, yeah, this is Jesus. You have him in your heart now. He'll tell you more things. She's like, wow. She's like, I go, have you ever encountered this stuff in New Age? She's like, no, this is way different. Oh, and then wow. so I got her information, and then... So I walked into the hotel that I was staying at, and I remember there was this one girl in the bathroom, and I just walked in. I was like, hey, I need to take a shower. I've been on a long flight all night, and I'm just really tired. And she's like, okay. So I went in and just, I didn't know what she believed, and I just started telling her my story, like what just happened. Oh, this girl just got saved, and all of a sudden she just, like, looked at me, and she's like, wow, you're really amazing. She's like, I never, like, you're, are you, like, really religious or something? I was like, no, I just love Jesus. So then, like, we, I just started taking her on the streets. And, like, we, just, we got ready. We went on the streets. I was just talking Jesus, Jesus, Jesus the whole time. We just started praying for people and prophesying over people. She wasn't saved yet. But she was prophesying over people. I just let her do it. I was like, okay. <laughs> and she literally just started weeping 
And immediately, like, I go, what's wrong? She goes, I feel like she's from Australia. So, and then I was just like, I feel like this is what I was made to do with my life. And I was just <laughs> like, yeah, it is. And then, like, um, then there was a, uh, I met this guy there, and he, like, was just watching me. Because at first he was just like, I think he liked me. And I was like, I'm married, brother. And, um, but I just kept on showing Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. <laughs> and like, uh, I, I just started like telling him my story, my testimony. We took him to this meeting. And in this meeting, him and this girl were actually supposed to go to this huge like start party where all these young entrepreneurs go in Las Vegas. And I was like, let's go to this prayer meeting. And I heard about going on in this hotel room. So we went to this prayer meeting. And these people have not been in anything like this. All of a sudden, they literally just started like repenting in front of everyone. Like, I can't take it anymore being in this room. <laughs> like, I, I just, I, I, I can't have sex or do these drugs or anything anymore. So we go back to the afterwards. We go out to this food court. And I just start telling him my test testimony and then I, I started telling him about like how the Lord's healed me because like I don't think the Lord can heal me and I started telling him about like you know the clocks Clark's about like dropping down and living in the spirit and how it's completely transformed the way I think that I didn't need drugs anymore I didn't need the sex anymore and like he just looked at me because I don't feel like God would do that for me so I started telling him a part of my testimony that I don't tell a lot of people unless the Lord tells me to and immediately like I remember the next morning he saw me and he said Janice, he goes, I feel like God can love me now. And he, get, he, like, he recommitted his life back to the Lord because he said a long time ago he was. And then we went into this ne next room. Some girl actually got raped there while we were there. And uh, she just, it was horrible, <laughs> that thing. But uh, so while we were there, we brought her into this room. And we were just like walking her through this process of freedom and like showing her how to like drop down and receive Jesus and she felt, because at first she said, I just want to get fat now, so no one will ever do this to me again. And, like, I was just like, no, 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 no. And I, I just started speaking truth to her. And as she, like, dropped down, she started feeling that love. And she started releasing forgiveness towards those guys that raped her that, the, the night before. Mm. And she felt completely, like, clean. And she was able to look herself in a mirror and not want to hit herself. And, oh, God, it was hard. But I can feel the Lord when I say that, yeah, Jesus, just keep on being with her. Um and then I went to another prayer group. I don't know. I didn't even make it to any of the business meetings. I was just praying <laughs> for everyone. <laughs> so then I went to this other prayer meeting, and all these people started encountering joy. And there was this another person that was really high up in the company I'm in. And she looked at me, and she goes, I don't feel like I can... Uh, she goes, you know, receive that joy. What's wrong with me? I go, oh, there's nothing wrong with you. It's really simple. Come over here. So I brought her to the side, and I just said, let's just ask Holy Spirit. Just drop down, because she had Jesus in her. I go, just drop down, and let's just ask Jesus, what's holding you back? She goes, oh, I see my father. And I was like, all right. So if we dropped down. She received forgiveness for whatever she was doing with her father. And immediately, the joy of the Lord started coming in. She was just smiling. She's like, wow. And now she's like wanting me and Andrew to pour into her team in Australia. They're like number three in Australia where I'm at. And it's just amazing. And then two nights, it was not yesterday, but the night before, this, the girl was actually staying me that flew me out to Vegas. She came out just to get poured into before she had to go back to Australia. She just left last night. And she's like, call everybody on my team. They have to have this Jesus. So she was just like calling everybody she could think of on her team. And immediately when I called her, this is my last one, immediately when I started talking to this girl, I just got this this thought. She was like, I just feel stuck. I just can't tell you what's going on with me. And I was just like, well, I was just like, let, let me give you this analogy. And I don't know why I kept on getting a rape victim analogy, like how the enemy tries to bind you when you're raped. And she goes, oh. And I was like, you got raped. That's what it is. That's what's holding you back in this business. And she started crying. She goes, oh, my God, I haven't told anyone. She was just like, I started this business because I wanted to feel good about myself again, but I haven't been able to do it because of this. And I walked her through this. She was weeping and crying, completely got free right then and there. Amen. Praise God. Amen. And that's just, and that's just so far today. Okay. All right. But I want Jennifer to read an email we got this morning that kind of changed the, the format for the service today because uh, uh, we got, full, uh, we got a, an email from Full Stature South Korea who has translated into Korean almost all of our material just as uh, uh, we've had a lot of it translated in the, in the Spanish and God's really using those translations so, Jennifer. Okay. Jonathan and his wife, Joanna Moon, 
came here in April and May of 2015, and they, his son had given him a copy of our book, Practicing God's Presence 24-7, and he was in Korea at the time, and he contacted us and wanted to know about training, so we told him if he could get here, we would set aside a month and do a month, he's a missionary, he's been former pastor and all this, that if he would get here, we would do a month of intensive training, and some other people signed up, and our, our whole pastoral team um, helped us do this every day of the week for a month, and before he even got here, he had translated all of our modules into Korean. Now, some of his background, he went to um, Getteschul Hanover Academy in Germany, Bunn University, specializing in economics in Germany. He would, um, and then he got his doctorate in economics at Cologne University. So he's been a pastor. He's a as well as a professor, professor so he's a, a brilliant man, and um, I have a whole page of things that he's been involved in, Christian studies and training. He has served as a ministry to minister to refugees, uh, ministry to Asians in Birmingham, UK, as a missionary, church planner and pastor in England, co-pastor of Jesus Fellowship Church, Birmingham Congregation, um, part of another church in Kingdom Faith London, a pastoral member of the leadership team, and founding and leading Kingdom Ministry Fellowship. He also so, said, I have studied everything out there. And he says, yours is the best fit for quickly seeing changed lives. Right. That's a nice compliment from someone who studied what, in his words, everything out there. And he said, this is brought a simplicity of Christ back to the church. Right. So we got a, an email from him. It came in uh, shortly before we came over to the building this morning. And it's an update on what he's involved in over in South Korea. Now, you're, almost everything we have, he has translated it and is using it in training. He's... Um, he says he's progressing in the work of establishing the ministry here at this end of Full Stature Ministries International, South Korea. We're doing two classes a week, Thursdays and Saturdays, on a three-month basis. The team academy and train uh, this time uh, 18 people. We're gathering every Tuesday evening for member training purposes. Um, People are becoming Full Stature Ministries Korea members and supporters. They're working at a small church with a pastor who was signed up to take the classes, a um, three-month module course, and then they are going to start the next courses end of September, beginning of October, and he's also setting up a follow-up course that he calls the leader's course for those who've come and who want to replicate this and train others, which in that course includes the um, practicing God's Presence book and workbook, which he's translated, um, modules one through four, the leadership course, um, the Team Academy 101, which probably not many of you are familiar with. That's one where you're put under pressure and expected to use the material while other people are giving you a hard time. In other words, so how to navigate. the goal is that no one falls through the cracks Mm -hmm. That in 40 years of troubleshooting, what I saw is the people that don't receive ministry usually just have one tiny misconception, and I say you don't walk away from them. You simply find a way to navigate. When they say this, you do this. When they say that, you say this. When they say this, and we're seeing very few people not receive ministry. Very, so, very few. There are more people that don't even want to receive ministry from anybody because they've been so disappointed when they've gone forward to get prayer and nothing happens from their point of view. So needless to say, he's also making good use of our troubleshooting manual, what to do if this happens, what to do if that happens. He's, this course for leaders also includes how to minister to sexual issues, which he's translated that whole thick manual into Korean. Um, he's teaching simple keys for self-deliverance, the biology of faith, Intimate prayer and corporate intercession, and the 60-day challenge is a must for this group. So this is a little bit of what he's doing now, and very, very exciting. 
um, what he's setting up over there. And he's also working with um, an organization that trains all the missionaries who are being trained in South Korea. So and about, he lives um, south of Seoul, Korea at this time. So we're very excited about Jonathan and Full Stature Ministry South Korea. Amen. Are you beginning to understand what I feel like the Lord spoke to me this morning? Inspiration before education, then activation. I believe you need to see that uh, I've, had, I've talked to a lot of people that are disappointed with impartation. Oh, I went up for prayer for impartation and nothing happened. You know, there needs, to be an, there needs to be not just the inspiration, that impartation, and this is evidence that it works. Not just the laying on of hands, but by association. You catch good and bad by association because it's a spiritual dynamic. And so we want to cover some of this today because I believe the message that the Lord laid on my heart was transference of spirit, but I think you need to see that it really works instead of theoretical. I'm tired of theoretical. I'm tired of dead-end theories that do not produce life change. My entire Christian life, I've only seen changed lives. And quite frankly, any of the lives that didn't change, I could probably tell you what, what, what the problem was, but it was still in their court as to whether or not they wanted to do something about it. Because troubleshooting is easy, but it's based on your level of consecration and your desire to make Jesus Lord. Not just your Savior, Lord. It's based on that criteria. Do you want Him Lord, not just Savior? And if that is the case, I've never seen anyone that wouldn't see change, and particularly the continual report that we're getting, even though we will minister to all ages, is that here is somebody, this is from Canada, here is somebody who's telling us how to do what we already knew we were supposed to do. Seasoned, 20, 30, 40, 50 year Christians are basically finding, I believe that it's, it's a preparation for a great harvest that's about to come and that we can't have babies raising babies. We're going to have to have people that are, that believers are going to have to be like mothers and fathers. We're going to have to reparent and reteach holiness and bring it into a realm of the supernatural instead of what the world's done to them all these years with brainwashing, basically. And it's the prince of the power of the air, so you know he's enforced it. So any brainwashing they got, seducing spirits have indoctrinated them so thoroughly. But what the Lord gave me this morning is he says, my two strongest anointings, uh, one is acceptance, Holy Spirit acceptance, acceptance that didn't come from man, acceptance that came from the Spirit of the living God, and it's available to you as much as it is to me. But when God gave it to me, he kept saying, your acceptance... So if there's people with rejection issues, your acceptance is far greater than their greatest rejections because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And you've got to start living that. You can't just quote that scripture. You have to live that with that mindset and that entire mindset. Also, discerning of spirits. I've had that from the time that I was a baby Christian, but it has to be developed by reason of use into a daily walk. And my discerning of spirits is greater than your fault-finding, suspicion, paranoid, unbelief, and judging. It would be good to say, I'm going to relinquish my right to judge and start discerning. To discern or to judge righteous judgment is to appraise it in light of the love of God. Real discernment sees the gold regardless of they got a Jezebel spirit or something. I am weary of what we call discernment in the church. I am weary of only seeing what's wrong. You get the eyes of Jesus. You have to get the heart of Jesus before you get the eyes of Jesus. And if you don't have the heart of Jesus, you'd just be a judge with religious terminology. God says, look for the gold. We should be gold miners. See the gold in them, and then obviously the darkness will stand out like a sore thumb, but you will have a strategy to remove the darkness to pull the gold out. And everybody's got gold. All right? So basically, uh, I wanted that included. I wanted inspiration before I even taught on it. Because if you don't think this is happening or this is theoretical, then it's not for me then you're, you're not going to open your heart and receive the best that you can receive today. But there's going to be transference that takes place here, the good kind of transference. 
But now we can just give a little background to transference so you understand what we're talking about. You know, by definition, uh, it's, it's possible for a person or a group of people, uh, spirit beings, to transfer or transmit, all right, to transfer or tra- transmit emotions, spirits, now listen, good or bad, good or bad, people can transmit bad, good or bad, to others, and they can receive it. Transference means that something's being transmitted or sent. Uh, I like this uh, in, in the Greek, uh, trans new migration. Don't you like that word? That's a nice fancy word for trance, meaning it's going from one place to another. Pneuma, spirit, is going from one place to another. Migration means to take up a new residence. I'll tell you what, I'm watching believers opening up knowingly. Now listen to this word, say it with me, unknowingly. Unknowingly opening up to the wrong spirit by association. Three people in your office are angry and you get irritated. Who evangelized who? Where is the greater one that is in me? Huh? That's not what I heard from Janice. That's not what I, what, what I heard from Nelsie. The greater one is in you, then you need to act on it. And that means you change the atmosphere. You don't get evangelized by the atmosphere. Real discernment is coming out of abounding love and real knowledge. Philippians 1.9, let your love overflow and abound in real knowledge. That means reality. That means experiential knowledge and all discernment. So where does the discernment come from? If it's not coming from the love of God, I've seen, I've heard uh, some of Janice's testimonies where the person says, get away from me. I don't like you. She goes, oh, well, anyway, I just want to minister to you. I just want to love on you. That's the attitude for success, isn't it? You can't go lick your wounds because someone said, get out of here. I don't want to hear it. Doesn't stop you from being loving. But when you continue to love, regardless of how they react to you, love never fails. But you've got to hold your heart open. It's like, here's what the Lord taught me as a baby Christian. He basically says hope. Nobody preaches on hope, hardly. Faith and love, but not hope. He said hope is, is the ability to hold the heart open till love comes through. Hope deferred means you shut your, the door of your heart and it's going to make you sick. So hope for me is spiritually keeping my heart open to God regardless of circumstances and regardless of people. Basically, isn't that all of life? Circumstances and people. <laughs> so you hold your heart open to Jesus regardless of circumstances. Now, transference, trans pneuma migration, to move from one place, a spirit moving, from one place to another place and taking up residence. I don't want residence. You know what I learned as a baby Christian? This is so simple, but if you did it, you would see remarkable progress in a short period of time. I was a baby Christian, and I just went, when I feel fear, God didn't give me a spirit of fear. If he didn't give it to me, I'm not taking it in. Just because I feel it down here or feel it in the room doesn't mean I have to own it. Doesn't mean that I have to surrender to it. All I know is I drop down to my spirit and I'm going, I will not tolerate fear in my spirit. I can feel fear because then I can help somebody. I don't care what's coming from them. I don't run away from them because they're fearful. But at the same time, here's the key word. How many, if you could make this distinction and practice this, you will see radical change in your life. There is a significant difference between bear witness and unknowingly taking it in and owning it. Isn't, wasn't that the truth, Linda, that you saw? After all the years of being Christianity and being a pastor, she basically found out that by reason of you, she was taking in the wrong spirit. Unknowingly. Nobody does this stuff on purpose, I don't think. If they are, they need real need ministry. If you mess up, it's not knowingly, but unknowingly you're not paying attention to the atmosphere you're in and you have a tendency to draw it in. Now, it can take place in the physiological realm. In other words, somebody gets a, a, a disease. It can be transferred, can it? Can't you catch stuff from other people? It can happen in, in the, from one person to another. 
Genetic information can be transferred from one generation to the next, parent and child. Uh, see, manifestation of negative atmosphere, negative uh, 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 spirits, basically, if you would take the attitude, even John Wimber did this in the early years, when there'd be a demonic manifestation, he'd say, the question is, and this is my question to you, is it coming or going? There was a, a historical spiritual father who basically said, rule num- he had rules, he had 14 rules for understanding experience in the spirit. And rule number one was, am I sinning and moving towards sin, continually sinning, and the Holy Spirit is kind of nipping at my backside, convicting me? Or am I moving toward God and the enemies at my backside trying to get me off track? At least, he says, when you start, know what is the direction you're going in from the heart. And then he listed a bunch of other things. Maybe next week we'll talk about it. But anyway, uh, we, we give in. Transference can be emotional. By the way, you cannot have a relationship with God or people without involving the emotions. The emotions are the gateway to your spirit, good or bad. If there's an attachment, good or bad, it, the emotions are required for the, either the fruit of the spirit or some wrong spirit. So, uh, and, and a lot of uh, Nelsie and, and, and Janice, I know in ministering to other people, one of the things they learn the quickest is there's hurting people out there and they, they are given the right answers for their head, but they're still hurting inside. Jesus takes your hurt. He'll take your pain. He'll take your sorrow. He takes the grief. He takes your sicknesses and your diseases, but he's going to take everything that's accompanied with it, including the emotional hurt and pain. He was tempted in every way. So you know what that means? That means he never gave in. He never owned it. We're going to have to learn how to resist more effectively if you're ever going to mature. We're lazy when it comes to Guarding our heart, for out of it flow the issues of life. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. This is what, the, everything good happens here. You need to get more God inside minded and learn to focus on the Jesus in you. All right? Now, transference can be spiritual. Evil spirits, uh, this is one that God taught me as a, a, as a young Christian. Uh, spirits like loneliness. Secular statistics say one in a one out of five people suffers from loneliness and isolation. And guess what they found? This is secularist. It's contagious. You could spend enough time around a lonely person and start isolating yourself and being feeling lonely and sad. Isn't that something? It's contagious. It's not just an emotion, loneliness. Loneliness is a spirit. And it and it's it basically comes against the authority of God. It's like, it's like, it's literally dishonoring God when you are lonely because God said, I will never leave you or forsake you. If you feel like God's not around, who left? He didn't leave. There's something on your part that is a barrier that needs to be removed. It's in your court. Now, impartation. Here's another thing that I saw by discernment. Many people, like say, say a person was a rape victim, and they see another rape victim. They identify emotionally with the pain, but they do not have the Zoe life of God to minister effectively to it. They call it ministry, but it's really just sympathy. It's identifying with their pain. I've got the same pain. Oh. That is not ministry. Ministry is when you did the pain of that rape situation to where God, you can talk about it and feel the peace of God. When you can feel the peace of God, you've got the resurrection life of God stored in you and it's available to minister to rape victims. Jennifer and I did for uh, Bruce Wilkinson. He had a meeting of 250 directors of crisis pregnancy counselors. And he asked three counselors to come. The diff- that, there's a distinction right there. Of the 250 directors, I would say 
Is that too high? Roughly 50, 60 percent had abortions themselves prior to Christianity or what have you. And so they became directors to help women. But I saw that the vast majority were not healed themselves. You know, you can become an activist and help people out of identification. But identification isn't going to minister the resurrection life that's necessary. We prayed for, now they had a professional counselor in it that did a counseling model. They did three people in two days. We did 35 people in two days. Not bragging, but it was basically, we, we just took them to Jesus and not a bunch of counseling. Let Jesus take the pain. 35 people, and we were refreshed. The counselors were worn out. And I'm not saying there's not a place for them because some people, if they're, thank God there is counselors, or they, they'd be dead by now, all right? But I'm telling you that for the average believer, you have the counselor living in you. You need to learn how to go to him, all right? Uh, it's one thing to go to the dentist for a root canal, but it's pretty lazy if you go to the dentist to brush your teeth. And the church is kind of like that, a little bit, a little bit on the lazy side, do it for me. Remember the first person that came to an altar when we planted our church? She came up and I said, all right, now put your hand right here. We're going to let the Jesus in you. Jesus in me? I came up here for you to do it to me. And I said, she only said verbally what a lot of people are thinking. I want you to be the total source of grace in my life. And I'm going, oh, no, 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 no. I want you to become everything you could possibly be, and I want to make you, you stand on your own two feet, and the Jesus in you is going to do it. Oh, that's not what I was planning on. Those are the people that, when they're uncomfortable with that concept, we say tomatoes belong in tomato patches, pumpkins belong in pumpkin patches, maybe you're in the wrong patch. They say, sounds like you're kicking them out, Pastor. No, I'm just simply saying, this is what we were called to do. I was called with one purpose, and that was to mature the saints, to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry and to equip them to stand on their own Full stature. We didn't name that on a whim. Full stature means I don't care where you're at. Where you're at. Some of you have to realize no matter how much Bible you know and how many schools you've been to and how many degrees behind your name does not necessarily mean that your, spiritual, your spirituality cannot exceed your emotional development. And you're... Your emotions won't let you go that far. Emotions is part of your soulish nature. It'll keep you anchored. It'll keep you shooting yourself in the foot when God wants to pull the good stuff out. Right? So, back to transference of spirit. The spirit and the soul are closely related. That's what I love Hebrews 4. When God was teaching me, he says, you're not going to Bible school yet. First, I'm going to teach you the school of spirit. He took me through Hebrews 4.12 and Isaiah 50. And Isaiah 50 was... Dennis was a talker, and he said, first of all, I'm going to get you to sit still. And I thought, oh, my God, I died. <laughs> sit still and not talk. He said, I'm going to awaken your ear morning by morning. I'm going to awaken your ear to hear. I'm going to give you the tongue of a disciple, but that means I'm going to do the talking, and you do the listening. I go, oh, kind of like in school, right? Kids don't do all the talking. It's the teacher, right? Well, he was the master, and he was going to teach me. And I, it was difficult to shut up. It was difficult to not talk. And so he took me through there, and then he took me to Hebrews 4.12. The Word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword. And he says, here's what I'm going to do inside you. The Word is going to discern you. Before you worry about discerning other people, yeah, Dennis, I know you can do that. I gave that to you. But in the meantime, I'm going to discern you. That's more important. So he says, I'm going to show you this is soulish, this is spirit, now choose. This is joint, this is marrow. And you know what joint and marrow was to me? It was the body of Christ. Because when bones are joined together, the blood flows. And he says, a lot of you might know the difference between soul and spirit, but your attitude toward joints and marrow is deficient. You're independent. You've never learned to become healthy enough, connected, to be interdependent. And then he says, and here's what discernment is really all about. The source, the source, the source. Say that back with me. The source, the source, the source. Because that will, con that will remove the confusion between judging and discerning. Man looks at the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. Man judges by word and gesture, body language. 
And don't say you don't because I've, I've been with you too long. Most of you Christians judge by body language. And there's certain truth to it. But I've experienced too many people who their body are trying to fool you with their words and fool you with their gestures, but their heart was emanating something else. The source, the source, the source. Real discernment identifies the source and the personality. And I can remember one time a guy uh, laughing, and he was in a course on tithing. Real excitable, laughable topic, right? And he went, ha, ha, ha. And the teacher said, ah, you got a breakthrough. That's, what, that's the way we discern. Ah, you got a breakthrough, because he laughed and lit up his hands. I felt anger. So later, at the class was over, I went over and I said, did you really get a breakthrough on tithing? He said, why? And I said, well, actually, I felt, felt, felt that you felt a little angry. He broke down and started crying and was weeping. He said, my father, if I ever showed anger, even mildly on my face, I got beat to a pulp. And he learned to develop a nervous giggle. I see a... There's a high-profile woman that does this, too. That when they giggle, it feels creepy. They're hiding anger. And a lot of times it's suppressed, but it manifests in something that you would think is pleasant. So what's discernment do? The source, the source, the source, the motive, the personality, the source. Okay. I think you'll remember that one. Uh, now, the soulish man doesn't understand. 1 Corinthians 2 says, For What man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. But the soulish man does not receive the things of the spirit, for they are foolishness to him. Nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. And the spiritual man discerns all things. That's what I want for you people to be spiritual men and women, to discern all things, which means you're coming from the motive, the source, the source, the source. It's kind of like the source. If the source is love, the force is love. The course you take is love. The source, the force, that's a good message, three points. Source, the force, the course. <laughs> all right. But anyway, you walk in it. You'll walk in it. But it'll be foolishness to the mental Christian. And this at every awakening, there will be warfare even within the church for the mental Christians and the experience-oriented Christians. Who was it that that happened to? I forgot his name, Jennifer, during the Great Awakening where he was saying, if I would work for the devil, if I would work for the devil and not for Jesus, I would convince Christians that they can, they can have the Holy Spirit and never really feel anything. George Whitfield. Because it was the battle even in that day during the awakening of the head Christians and the spirit Christians. I know what side I'm on because when I was a baby Christian, God took that x-ray. He took a black x-ray because I was looking. I went, I'm in my 20s and I'm looking. Everybody's in this room's older than me. And God took a black x-ray screen like this. And all of a sudden, all the people were white like bones. And he showed me big, big heads and itsy bitsy spirits. He goes, You minister to the spirit. Minister to, that's where they need to grow. They don't need to grow in their head. They already know more than you. They need to grow in their spirit, in the grace and in the real knowledge of God. Faith to faith, glory to glory, victory to victory. Okay. So you can't prove transference of spirits to a soulish person. You can't prove it. Because. They're operating only with what they understand in their head. But it de it, they, they depend on their five natural senses. But here's the three things that God said. If you're going to train people in the days ahead and prepare them for a great outpouring of harvest so that they are beneficial to the rest of these new converts that are coming in, you teach them three things. Teach them, first of all, how to be aware to the Jesus in them. How to be aware. Secondly, then understand what that is that they're experiencing. So it was basically, it was awareness or inspiration before education. In other words, I'm going to teach you to be aware of the Spirit experientially, then I'm going to teach you 
what the Word says about it. It will change the way you look at certain scriptures because all of a sudden you're looking at them through new eyes. You're looking at it through the eyes of experience. And when God took me to Hebrews 4, 11 and, uh, 12 and 13, He basically said all things, He says uh, the Word of God is quick. What, what, what do you hear up here when you hear that scripture? The Word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword. Anybody picturing anything? The Word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, able to divide asunder. You know what I was picturing the whole time? Jesus, not ink on a page. And when I saw that, that He is the living Word, the Word was made flesh and He dwells in me, it took on a whole new characteristic. It wasn't ink on a page, it wasn't the letter of the law, but it was the Spirit that gives life. And here's what the Lord did to confirm that. I'm going, wow, the Word of God it's quick and powerful, sharper. He's on the inside of me saying, this is flesh, Dennis, this is spirit. This is joint, this, uh, joints and marrow. Thoughts and the intents of the heart. That's me in there. And if you follow me, I will, I'm the love of God in you that is making a distinction between the motive, the thoughts and the intents of the heart, not the head, the heart. And then verse 13 confirmed my vision. He basically said, and all things are naked and open to the eyes of him. He didn't say the word. All things are naked and open to the eyes of him. And God confirmed that you will do things with, you will relate to the living word different than you will relate to a concept. And he says, the way you relate to me moment by moment person to person, and prayer. Before I went to the, I took, I took four Bible schools, different camps purposely, but before I did, God taught me that in, in understanding uh, this, this discernment, it was basically that he was the living word, and I was to commune with him 24-7, that it's possible you have a spirit. You don't do this with your head. If you're a head Christian, you'll go, I can't do that. One guy tried to do it hour, every hour on the hour, talk to God. That's all mental. But your spirit has that capacity even while you're sleeping to commune with God. But he said there's, all, there's no prayer time and then regular time. You don't go in and out of prayer. Does this make sense so far? He said there's only special time and all the time. Special time and all the time. Isn't that pretty much moment by moment? Special time and all the time. And basically he says, and that is the spiritual man who will discern all things that operates out of a mindset that there's special time and all the time. Now, here's another important part. Now, I, know, I know Janice will like this because I heard her teaching on this a, a little bit. Purpose. How many need to hear that more and more? right? Paul and Catalina, you're doing that in KBA, right? Purpose. People need to tap into their purpose, their destiny, whether it's business or ministry or what have you. God wants you to see purpose. But here's what I'm saying. The two main keys to understanding transference is purpose. And a long time ago, God basically would say, like, in the name of Jesus and the blood of Jesus. But God was saying it's in the nature of Jesus that the blood of Jesus and the name of Jesus work. You can't use the name of Jesus without the nature of Jesus. An unsaved person using the name of Jesus is probably not going to get very far. It's not a rabbit's foot. It needs to be connected to the divine nature. And what God showed me was every spirit, holy unholy. Every spirit not only has a nature that is discernible. See, you've got to move beyond good and bad, God and the devil. You've got to know what attribute of God is he revealing at this moment? What attribute of the demonic is being manifested so that I can have a strategy to combat it effectively? You need to know its nature. And here's the key word. I want you to say it back to me. Nature and purpose. Say purpose. Purpose. Every spirit, good or evil, has a purpose. Did you ever think of that? What do you think a spirit of fear's purpose is? 
I'm telling you, if you know the nature, if you can discern the nature, you've got the strategy because its nature will match its purpose. What do you suppose a deaf and dumb spirit does? Huh? What? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Seriously, the nature matches its purpose. Now, what God's basically saying is if the nature matches the purpose, there's a principle of purpose that says what's in its nature, what is its purpose, discern that purpose, and you've got a strategy to effectively bring redemption. Now, I've been in a lot of services where people laid hands. Laying on of hands is a foundational doctrine, correct? Repentance from dead works, faith toward God, laying on of hands, baptism. Those are foundational, elementary principles. Laying on of hands is not some kind of dead ritual. However, I've seen empty hands on empty heads, all right? (laughs) But nonetheless, that doesn't diminish the fact that if you have the Spirit of God in you and you lay hands that there is purpose in that. It can be for baptism in the Holy Spirit. It can be done without the laying on of hands. Laying on of hands is just that personal contact. Some people almost need personal contact. All right? Some like the oil on the forehead. God can operate in all different ways without that, though, can He? And you've seen it, and you've had it happen. So... Transference happens with the laying on of hands. Although, you know what? Over the years of dealing with people in problematic situations, I have not run into too many people that were damaged goods because of the laying on of hands. I have had them all primarily damaged goods because of who they associated with. They caught it more by who they hung around with for a long period of time. I always said, I don't go to a negative person and ask them to pray for me. Somebody that's depressed, pray for me. Not likely you don't do it either, do you? Who do you go to? You want to go to somebody that's in victory. Somewhere where you feel like you're receiving something. All right. But here's what, here's what the Lord's saying. It can be the laying on of hands. You can pick up or transfer bad stuff by a weakness in your flesh. If you have a weakness in the flesh, by that I mean you're, you, you want some other person, place, or thing to fill that need other than Jesus. That's a weakness of the flesh. And believe me, there's no voids in your life. Any, any, all of your needs are available in Jesus, but if that need isn't being met by Jesus, you found a substitute somewhere. And, and the Lord said, Jeremiah, my people have committed two evils. They've forsaken me, the fountain, and they've hewn for themselves a substitute. So a lot of times in your prayer time, look for a substitute. If I need acceptance, where do I look for it? Do I get it directly from Jesus? Or am I looking for it from people, from a job title, from career? Hmm? Is it wrong? Those things wrong? No. But it is if you're getting something from them that you should be getting from Jesus. All right? I'm not going to get into that, but there's a beautiful example in Genesis. This could be nice homework. Genesis 48, verses 8 to 20. It talks about uh, when Israel saw Joseph's son and he laid hands on them. He changed the birth order by crossing his hands. And that's, that's interesting to understand that because there was a purpose in Israel, had a purpose from God in him to contradict the, the birth order. And so that means that there was something in Israel being directed by God, a purpose, and those hands were anointed. There was transference and there was purpose. But you don't have to do this by laying on of hands. What about the 12 spies? Huh? Joshua and Caleb? What's the scripture say? It, didn't, it wasn't an attitude. It wasn't an emotion. The scripture says... Joshua and Caleb have a different spirit. And it even says that those spies that came back brought an evil report. 
Do you see how unknowingly you could suck in an evil report? I don't care if it comes from your doctor or what it comes from. Your friend. And what we've discovered over the years, huh, Jennifer? Most of you have done this all by yourself. <laughs> you, instead of bearing witness to something negative, identifying it for, to be an overcomer, you take it in and then say, woe is me. By reason of use, you can get so used to taking it in that you feel like a victim when God wants you to be a victor, right? So how does this crossing of hands, you know how that happens in the church in a real practical way? It'd be like someone that came into the church, says, this is my DNA, this is my family, and then they've been there for 12 years, and then someone new comes in and gets, and gets elevated before them. What's the typical response? I was here before they were. After all I've done. Hmm? And you did it with the wrong motive if you say that. Now, here's where we're, where, where we're going with this. I believe that the word of the Lord in transference right now, what God wants to reveal. We've already given you inspiration to show that it works, right? People have caught the DNA. They become people helpers, and that is our goal, to reproduce reproducers. My goal was never to have a church. Besides, my whole approach to pastoring is different than pastors. Pastors are called to feed, to feed you. I want you to have an internal experience. Pastors are the total source of grace, and they're going to be the answer to everything that ails you. I'm going to get you to stand on your own two feet, go to Jesus in you, and stand up. Huh? That's not popular. I'm not trying to be popular. <laughs> I want your call and your purpose out. I want to pull the gold out. If you don't want to consecrate your life to God, that's your business. But basically, I demand performance. Most pastors don't demand performance. The congregation demands performance of him. Bless God, our pastor made 4,000 house calls this year. Probably killed them too. No, no, yeah, nobody's going to call me for a house call. I know that. I basically, my goal and the call of God that's on my life from day one was Dennis, you were appointed to Timothy 111, a preacher, an apostle, a teacher. And in that, you were called to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry, and your call was to maturity, full stature ministries, maturity. That is my total goal, to reproduce reproducers who are get beyond that babyhood stage. Because right now it's prevalent to be seeker-friendly, and that may have its place, but that's not my place. I had a young man came here one time and been years in, in a, a, a seeker-friendly church, and he came here and he goes, that was the deepest message I ever heard. And I'm going, <laughs> you really get, need to get a little more exposure. Go on the internet, <laughs> something. Because when people say, well, that's too difficult. I don't understand that. I go this way. Why don't you understand it? That should be the more responsive uh, answer. Why don't I understand what he's talking about? Wisdom searches out the matter. Search it out. Find out if it's so. Isn't that what the Bereans did? Find out whether that's so. That's what Jennifer did. She trusted her. When we first got married, she trusted her brother more than me. <laughs> she said, I've known him longer <laughs> until there was a track record. And she goes, my goodness, this really works. I'm tired of dead end trails. Hmm? Anybody tired of dead end trails? Yes. Okay. Now, here's what God's saying. We're moving now, Jennifer and I are basically saying that transference is now taking the form of mentoring. And in what form of mentoring? You know, our, our basically it's to equip to maturity or full stature, that we know. That was always been our scripture, Ephesians 4.13, till we all come to the unity of the faith, knowledge of the Son of God unto a mature man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And 1 Corinthians 4.15, for though... You might have 10,000 instructors in Christ. You do not have many fathers. 
God basically told us to reparent the church. I don't look at your chronological age. I look at the fact that you need reparented. Reparented, in, in other words, that whatever your negative experience has been in real life parenting, and even if they're the most wonderful people on the face of the earth, guess what? You weren't the most wonderful kid. <laughs> See, the, the blame game doesn't work, does it? So you had the best mother and father in place. You still need to identify with God as your father more clearly than any person. And what God wants to do, I believe, through reparenting is basically bringing you to the place where what mothers are supposed to do, feel safe and secure. So I'll be real nice and keep you safe and secure until you trust me. And then when you trust me, I'm going to start pulling the gold out, start giving you tests, start making you stand on your own two feet, saying, don't call me. You do this. Do the homework. You don't do the homework, don't call me again. You didn't do the homework from the last time. Do you know that we need that? We all needed that from our fathers. Mothers to give us the jelly sandwich, send us off to school, make us feel comfortable. Everybody's got a jelly sandwich. But the father's going, you go out for that team, you're going to go to practice. You go to practice, you're going to do your homework. Guess what? You're going to have a quiz. You're going to have a test. Jennifer knows how to father. This has nothing to do with gender, by the way. Jennifer fathers. She gives quizzes constantly. She gives homework constantly. And if she sees that you don't do the homework, we go, next. There's got to be someone hungrier. There's got to be someone who wants change. There's got to be someone that, that wants to consecrate their life more fully and completely, right? That's not, my pastor doesn't talk like that, Dennis. Well, if that's your pastor, I'm not your pastor. I believe that what God wants us to do in this reparenting process is to release destiny in the people and remove the barriers from that destiny. In many cases, it's something very easy, but it can beset you for years. You know, you can be highly gifted, you can be, you can be biblically literate, but there can be one silly barrier breaking you from coming into the fullness of what God has for you. One silly attitude. And so what God says, Dennis, you focus on molding their character, and they may not like that. You focus on reconstructing their motivations. It's not what you did, it's how you did it. It's the motive behind what you did. Did you do that to be seen and heard, or did you do that to glorify Jesus? Real reparenting is going to mold the character, reconstruct the motivations, and transform attitudes. And when I had an attitude, just like, uh, uh, like you shared about complaining, when I had an attitude, God went and got me, on, got me in the school of the Spirit, and He says, plus and minus, good attitude, bad attitude. He goes, there's no true positive attitude other than the cross of Jesus. You can have a lot of good attitudes, but if it hasn't passed through the cross, it doesn't have the resurrection life that's going to minister to someone else. The only true positive is where your will crosses his will and the new creation rules. I mean, I've seen unsaved people with positive attitude. No cross, that's not true positive. And God says, I said, well, God, how do I stay in a true positive attitude? He said, you live a forgiveness lifestyle. And when you forgive, it's unilateral. Don't you worry about how they respond. It's how you free yourself to get back right with me under my lordship and let the peace of God rule. Here's, what, here's the goal of transferring. I want to transfer as you saw witnessed here in the beginning. Really, just Nelsie and, of course, South Korea and, and, uh, and, of course, we saw Janice. Do you see how that was reproduced in real life? It really works, and many of you in the congregation are to test to this as well. But God's basically speaking that in these days, we're to transfer our spirit as a mentor, to transfer the spirit of us, just as Moses transferred to the seventy. But here's the command he's given us, the same command that Paul gave to Timothy. Now listen to these words. It involves the leader pouring his life into the protege or a disciple or transferring their spirit, all right? Our stuff is caught more than it's taught. 
I've watched people that took it and didn't get it, and I've watched people that caught it almost instantly and ran with it. And they had a, their own no-so on the inside. This is it. So if you haven't caught it, I promise you are in your head yet. Mentoring involves the leader pouring his life into the protege or disciple or transferring his spirit. And here's where Paul did it to Timothy, committing to faithful ones. What kind of ones? Faithful ones. The task of stewarding the mysteries of the kingdom of God. The definition of commit. Listen to this, I love it. 2 Timothy 2.2 2 in the Amplified. And the instructions which you have heard from me, along with many witnesses, transmit, there's a trans new migration, transmit and entrust as a deposit to reliable and faithful men who will be competent and qualified to teach others also. Reproduce reproducers. Commit to faithful men. Deposit in them. It goes beyond simply passing information. When I was a young Christian, my spiritual father said, I want you to preach. My first, one of my first sermons was the seven levels of communication. I don't want to skip all those levels of communication. Most of it's just information. Uh, the last one was the highest form of communication is to be an expression of Jesus. What did Jesus say to Philip? Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That is the highest form of communication. When the living word is being expressed through you, not through instruction and teaching, but when he's an expression that by the life that you live, by the words that you spoke, and by the deeds that you do. When all three are a culmination of an expression. And I believe that that's really what God wants. God wants basically us to be an expression of him, his personality flowing through us. To go beyond passing simple information. Are you ready for that today? It's a product of opening your heart. You can do this right where you're at, right where you're in your seats. It's a question of getting out of your head and saying, if this Dennis has anything of value, if I found these truths to be, I've searched these truths out and I found that it worked in my own life. I caught it. Raise your hand if you think you've caught it. We've got a lot of visitors, so I don't know, but you've caught it. Most of you are reproducing it. Hell's reproducing it in his house group regularly, seeing changed lives, right? Victor, and he's had people standing on his porch crying and weeping with changed life. I was born again for changed lives. And all the changed lives that God ever brought into me was not for salvation, but it was to move them from where they were at to the next level in the fulfillment of their destiny, the next level. I've heard a lot of people preach about going to the next level, but they, to me, I want to see it. I want to see change lives. I want people to come and say, I want to find out what happened to those people. I had unsaved people come to my churches in the past because I saw the change in my wife. I saw the change in my daughter. I want to see what's going on there. Their life was a life message as opposed to information or trying to convince somebody. Right? I'm going to put Paul and Catalina on the spot. Come on up here. I want you to close with. They've been through our training modules. I married them. She was a lawyer from Russia. He's a businessman from Austria. Stand over this way a little bit so they can see. Okay. <laughs> Let's talk to. How did this impact you? Did it work? No. <laughs> you have to work harder no. on with him. It didn't work for him. Yeah, go ahead. Um, well, one of the first things that we did um, before we got married is we really decided to take it serious. And uh, Dennis and Jennifer were kind enough to mentor us and to walk with us through our premarital counseling, if you wish. But um, we decided to really be serious about it and took 60-day challenge, and it took us exactly 60 days to complete it. We were very, very intentional about it, and it's honestly, it was the best thing that we have ever done. Um, we've been married for two years now. We still see 
the effect of it. I mean, it was fantastic. We didn't have to deal with many, many things that normally when you get married, you have to deal with. We went straight for, like, for the good and for deeper stuff. We didn't have to deal with baggage. We didn't have to deal with frustrations. We had our lives that we lived before we met and before we got married. Um, it really, really helped to build trust in a very healthy way, not in codependent way, but from the freedom and from the place of healing to share, to build trust, to really have that healthy bonding and to enter into marriage um, fully knowing and fully trusting a person and not having to go through the first initial you know, crisis and baggage. And even now we implemented every single day, we went through um, all of the four modules, um, we see the effect of it in our everyday life. Before we go to bed, we take an inner, inner inventory. If there is something that upset us, if there's something that happened that we stuffed, Lord, bring it up. Uh, we Often we would have the 60-day challenge audio with Dennis um, leading people through it. Um, on the background, we fall asleep with it. Um, sometimes we turn it on in the morning to wake up with it. I mean, we just live it and breathe it. We practice it. it we made it our own. We talk to people left and right about it. Um, there is nothing, yeah, there is nothing else that we found that works. And I can, I think people can see it in some ways. Um, it's, it's just really great. It, it changed our lives for, for do, good. Do people seek you up for prayer? Well, I mean, it's, it's more and more and more. Um, we have like every, um, yeah, whenever I'm in small groups, whenever I, whenever we, Whenever we meet, mostly whenever we meet a new couple, yeah. you know, you meet a party or whatever, you get together, and you share and you share a te testimony. We usually always share the 60-day challenge, like literally every single time, and we and we recommend it every single time to anybody. And I mean, I have several friends, and I and I know I I have friends that that are married, you know, for for. 10, 15 years, and I'm like, and I listen, you know, and everybody has their, their problems and stuff, and I'm like, wow. Don't name names. I was like, <laughs> I don't have that at all, actually. You know, I have so many things I, we don't have. And it's mm -hmm. not because we are that great. It's because we were yeah. blessed to be given tools and the, yeah. and, and the, right the equipment that we know what to do, even though if those things do come up. Right, right. So, yeah. Amen. That's what we do. Very good. Very good. Very good. Do you understand that in, this was named after Jennifer when we first got married? In less than 60 days, because I worked with you four days a week in about six weeks, her mentor that knew her her whole life said, what happened? Because they wrote Jennifer off as too emotionally damaged to amount to anything. This is a Bible school president, but she was so accustomed to what I was not accustomed to. She was accustomed to seeing people get saved and not change. And from the time I was a baby Christian, I only saw changed lives. I still only see changed lives. So I don't, fortunately, I didn't have that theology, and I saw the gold in Jennifer. I said, I, there's a world-class teacher there. And she was written off as, her, your mentor's theory was based on if you're not pretty well adjusted when you get saved, you only go so far. Isn't that horribly negative? I know where it came from. I know where it came from. It came from observation. But I'm telling you what, that observation is going to start changing real quick here because God's preparing a people for a powerful outpouring and an awakening. And I'm going to tell you something. We can't have babies raising babies. We can't have hurt people just identifying with people's hurt. And hugging each other because you got the same hurt. We need to realize that every time that you, that you die in your flesh and let Jesus rule over any issue, you store up resurrection life that never goes away and becomes a continual anointing. Out of your belly flows a river of anointing. Every barrier when it's removed, a river of anointing is flowing out so that the, the dying of your flesh produces life in other people. That makes it worth it, doesn't it? Every, you, your life could be like a pin cushion. So what? You let Jesus in those various areas where you've been like a pin cushion and rays of anointing are flowing out of those holes. So the more holes you got, the more rivers you got. Deal with it. And 60 days, I want you to hear this because I, I know this is not the norm. 
you can, if properly applying yourself, in less than 60 days, deal with the baggage of the past. Deal with the baggage of the old stuff. Because there's usually, in your present walk, if you've been plateauing, there's something in the past that's still an anchor around your feet. Get rid of that thing. It's not hard. Some people, well, I don't prescribe to uh, going into the past. All right? I'm saying this. I just went like a child, and I said, I'm not going into those arguments. I just do this. Search me, O God, for any anxious thought or hurtful way, and I will deal with any silly thing that pops up. That's humility. I don't care when it happened. If it pops up, I'm going to be like a child. I think some of us are not childlike enough. We have our theories and our theologies so instilled that God can't get past them. We're crystallized in some of these things. I'm just saying, why not return to what the Scripture says? Search me, O God, for anxious thoughts, emotional thinking, hurtful emotional choices. And when you deal with the emotion behind the choice and the emotion behind the, the thought, you have the authority to renounce and pull down strongholds and not have to do it again and again and again. How many like the concept of John 15? Really, that's what we're teaching how to abide. This is not counseling. This is how to abide. This is not inner healing. And I like to say this before. This, the Lord had this on my heart. I have to say this for the Ustream benefit. I don't picture something horrific happening in my life. I face it until it changes the peace down here. That's the cross. I'm seeing all kinds of goofy stuff where I... I see a horrific situation. Oh, I see Jesus in there, and he's hugging me, and he's smiling. That's nonsense. Don't, don't do that kind of stuff. You don't have to water it down. The cross is, I face my pain, and God takes my pain. That's the cross. Not, don't sit, oh, that really wasn't blood. That was ketchup. I mean, I've seen them do every weird thing out there. The weirdest people I've ever met are inner healers and prophetic people. Come on. We can make weirdness out of anything, can't we? All right? And I'm very pro-prophetic, and I'm pro for emotional healing. Emotional healing is as easy as breathing for me, and it will be that way for you. But you don't have to go for three to five years navel-staring. By the way, navel staring. This is, for, this is for the naysayers. You know what navel staring is? That's when self is searching self. I do the scriptural way. Search me, O oh God. I want to be God-searched, not self-searched. So don't confuse the two and throw everything in the one basket. That's your fatherly reprimand. Do you feel corrected? Huh? So, Father, we just thank you for this day. We thank you that we're moving forward and upward, victory to victory, faith to faith, glory to glory. And right now we're just releasing a transference. I just want to release that spirit of acceptance. I believe there is a mantle of the Father's love that's flowing out right now. And he's just, I receive all that I needed and didn't receive. Huh? I, re I release forgiveness to parents and any authority figure. I release out of my belly flows a river of loving forgiveness. This sets me free from any, any uh, judgments that I've made on authority figures. I release mom and dad. I release teachers. I release uh, pastors. I release all business leaders, all employers. I release out of my belly's flowing uh, just a, a volumes of loving forgiveness is flowing out to them. I release them from my judgments. I release them. I release them. And now, all that I needed, even from them, and didn't receive, I'm going to receive from God the Father right now. Even through a male voice, this is my beloved daughter in whom I am well pleased. Drink that in your spirit, not your head. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. I drink in the love of the Father. All that I needed and never received, I am welcoming that, 
the Spirit of God, the love of the Father, to take up his abode in me more fully and more completely, that I would be just extravagantly lavished upon with the love of the Father. He always loved me, but oh, I can ravish his heart when I open up and just say, more, Father, our Father, our Father, I welcome, I welcome that love in Jesus' name. Reparent me, God. Reparent me all that I needed and didn't receive. I want to make available in my heart and in my life. I want it directly from you. I want your approval. I want your acceptance. I want to drink in that anointing of the Father's love for me. There's a mantle of love falling upon hearts right now. I allow it to incubate over my heart, and I absorb it like a sponge. I drink in. I drink in the love of the Father to lead me and direct me in the way that I should go. I want to be an expression. I want to be an expression of the Father, just as Jesus said. I want to be an expression of your love for, your, for the saints and for your love for all people. Saved and unsaved, I want to be an expression. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com. Did you know that we have an online school available? Hi, I'm Pastor Jason Clark. We invite you to join our international community of almost a thousand students currently enrolled in a school like no other. Team Embassy equips believers to live in the spirit by giving them the how-to tools for wholeness intimacy with God, and living the abundant life Jesus promised us. You will learn how to heal emotional pain quickly and completely. You'll discover amazing keys to tap into the fruit of the Spirit and practice the presence of God as a lifestyle. Exciting courses available include the 60-day challenge, self-deliverance, healing rejection, codependency, intimate prayer, the functions of the human spirit, and many, many more. It's formatted so that you could take it with you on all your mobile devices. Sign up today at training.teamembassy.com. Be transformed. Become all God created you to be. You will never be the same.